so I'll, I'll start. I, they're not. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. <laughs> so you heard a lot also about tick theory. So um, let's summarize what he what it says substantially. It's that halos form out of linear density peaks at the time in which their linear over density is more than the halo size is worth a unit. Now, if you try to trace this back in the literature, it's not that easy to understand where it, where it came out. So it's already in Doroskiewicz 70, it's mentioned. And there is an entire page in Peebles 80 that describes the process. It became very popular you know, after Kaiser basically used it to describe the clustering of Bell clusters. But it has been hardly tested against simulation. As far as I know, there are basically only two old <coughs> papers which actually reach opposite conclusions regarding whether peaks are associated with halos or not. There was an early attempt some years ago made by me and Avishai and Yehuda, but a few years ago we decided to actually take it you know, very seriously and try to understand what was going on. So we use the power of modern simulations. And just to give you an idea, so this is one halo, group mass, so. We identify all the peaks in the initial conditions that end up in the halo. And there are 30,700 of them on different scales, of course. And you see that there is a peak on the scale. Actually, you find the mass, and its linear over density is slightly above the spherical collapse threshold. So you try to match our halo and peaks both ways. And if you do that, you find out that basically all the cluster size halos are associated with peaks on the right mass scale while the number drops rather rapidly when you go to smaller and smaller scales. Sorry? I'm sure, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, we can check in the paper later, but anyway. So this is if you actually look at the exact halo mass, if you allow a factor of two difference in the masses, this number go up a bit. Instead of 70, for instance, here we get 84%. <coughs> also. But there is still a significant fraction of halos that are not associated with peaks on the right mass scale. Okay. Yeah, yeah, in, in linear scale, it's actually very small. I mean, it's just 30% or so. I mean, it's um, actually, after Vincent's talk, I dig out from a paper this, <laughs> this plot, which shows actually the, the distance between the central mass of the halos and the closest peak on the right mass scale. And you see, when, when you are in very large halos, while well, everything is within the Lagrangian radius of the object, but when you go to smaller scale, you start developing a second peak, which is actually outside. And that probably spoils so the, the prediction you have for the peaks when you go to smaller scales. Anyway, we, we can discuss about this. So now, uh, identify halos are actually zero. I know, uh, because I have other things to show. I was afraid about that. <laughs> this doesn't count for the 15 minutes. <laughs> well, these are those who have peaks. Peak halos, these are kind of peakless, I think. Okay? The, peak, the closest peak is outside the Lagrangian region. Well, yeah, that, you know, I don't know the answer, honestly. Yeah, there, is a, there is a characteristic scale, it seems. That. So trace back halos in the is zero in the initial conditions. This is the density field, the linear density field. The yellow line shows the 1.69 linear over density. This is a clear peak halo, you know, totally sits on a density peak. This is one what we call peakless halo. You see, they tend to be kind of very elongated in the initial conditions, and they tend to sit in between peak, peaks. They, they're totally generated by flow of particles from the underdense regions that share cross in the middle. Yeah. Now, another slide I added today, just light warning to people doing peak exclusion set. Um, so this is done in the initial condition of a simulation. And so what is changing between this panel is just the smoothing scale. So this is a small smoothing scale, this is a big smoothing scale. And now look what happens to this guy here. It's clear peak there, 
but you keep smoothing and at a certain point these two peaks merge because of the smoothing <coughs> and there is no peak anymore there. And actually the mass scale of the halo is this. So this would classify as a peak halo, but actually it's generated by peak on a smaller scale, which accreted more mass than expected because it flew from the under dense region into this space. Anyway, we tried hard to understand whether there is, in the end, in the final condition, is there a difference between the peak halos and the peakless halos? So we look at density profiles and so on, we couldn't find anything. The only thing we found is that they are substantially clustered differently. So the peakless halos are much higher clustering, almost a factor of two in the correlation function than the peak halos at fixed halo mass. And the other funny thing is that they are more clustered in Eulerian space, but they are less clustered in Lagrangian space. So it means there must be a velocity bias effect there that alters the one plus B Lagrangian in the B Eulerian. Anyway, this is all what I wanted to say about peaks. Now let's go to a slightly different subject. So this is <coughs> mega parsecs. So this is 30. This is one. Choose the scale. It's pretty much constant for this. Lagrangian Eulerian. Redshift 70, redshift 60. Um, so now let's go to a slightly different issue. Um, so we all know, I think 99 more or less, <laughs> that if you play this game, you trace back Helix initial condition, measure their actual over density, um, at high masses is very close, if you use a spherical topaz filter, it's very close to the spherical collapse model prediction, but a low mass is you're substantially above that. And this is actually, the, the line is the fit that Bravi and collaborators did just to reproduce the mass function in the GIF simulation. And this is actually what you measure in our current simulation. It's exactly on top of it. But it's, it's, you know, this is measure really halo by halo, okay? It's generally the, this is the average. And you see there is a lot of scatter that you can quantify in this way. It scales like 0.42 watts to some power. And now, how do you interpret this? So there is the classic explanation that now is in textbook material. You basically say that you start with a kind of spherical Lagrangian region, which is sheared into an ellipsoid that then turns around and collapses. And the most popular, there are different versions of this. The most popular one is the Bond and Myers model. And since it's known that random points in a gas random field experience stronger shear when the filter size is reduced, substantially what uh, Jung and Ravi and Betty concluded is that more strongly shear perturbations require high initial density contrast to overcome the fact of stretching and collapse by a particular size. Okay? So now you can try to say how, how does this work if you compare halo by halo in a simulation. So here is the linear over density of proto halos in a simulation, linear extrapolated to today. And this is the linear delta required in the ellipsoidal collapse model for the perturbation to collapse at the same redshift which you identify with this redshift zero. So it's contour plots, and these lines are the medians at different halo masses. And what you see, it doesn't do too bad, but the prediction tends to be a bit too high for the delta. But there is a clear segregation in with halo masses. And actually, if you want to get it right on average, you have to reduce it by roughly 15%. So this, you measure everything in the simulation in the, in the proto-halo, you measure the, um, the, the three lambdas, and you evolve with the, um, with the ellipsoidal collapse model requiring collapse at ratio zero. So the only value is the normalization of the lambdas, okay? So this. Now, however, if you go, uh, if you actually look at the, the proto in the initial condition, you find that they're not spherical at all. They tend to be elongated, and in this particular case, so this is the density field, this is the linear velocity field, this is the proto-halo. You see, it's clearly a peak halo, but the density bound, well, the boundary of this proto-halo doesn't align at all with the density profile. So there are many papers that use the density profile of peaks to determine where this is the boundary of the halo, but the two here are not at all correlated. This is actually funny. This is a, 
isopotential contours, and you see that the isopotential is actually kind of aligned with the isopotential contours. Yes. So what you have to take home here is that photoelectrons are not spherical, and this is how they change as function of mu. And typically, they tend to be triaxial with axis ratio 0 0.8, 0 0.8, if you want just one typical number. Then you can say, OK, they, they are not spherical. They are ellipsoidal in the initial conditions. Do they correlate with the tides? And actually, you find an extremely good correlation in direction at the level of 99%, and a decent correlation in the amplitude. So the ratio, the tidal ellipticity and the protohelio ellipticity are quite strongly correlated. So this gave us the motivation to try to modify the ellipsoidal plus model in the following way. Instead of starting from a spherical initial condition, start from an ellipsoidal condition which is then sheared again and will evolve again, will turn around and collapse, but with totally different timing with respect to the Bond and Myers ellipsoidal collapse. Just to give you an idea, these are a few examples, focus on one of them. So this is, we start from a sphere, and this is the tidal ellipticity and prolateness. This is what the Bond and Myers collapse model would give. This is what the modified would give. What you basically happens in this case is that the three axes collapse at the same time. This is because this is actually elongating the initial condition in such a way it un undoes the work of the shear. So as you say, if you have stronger shear here, more material will manage to get there at the same time. It's exactly, we use exactly the same. We just modify the initial shape. So now you can ask, OK, use this modified collapse. How does it work? And actually, if you look at face value, it has the nice property that you don't have any more segregation with halo mass, but it actually does work. Okay? On average, it's actually you need a bigger correction than this if you just do this. But I want to convince you that if you do something else, which is actually ease in the body simulation, that model will work much better than the other one. So what is the something else? Let's go back to try to understand what is the origin of this scatter in the barrier that Marcello just showed before. Now, sorry for the busy plot. I mean, but so here now you have this case peak height, in this case ellipticity, versus the linear over density. And now you clearly see the colors here segregate. And what are colors is formation time of the halo. So if you plot a fixed halo mass, the formation time of the halos, halos that formed earlier tend to be associated with higher peaks in the initial condition rather than halos that collapsed later. Um, well, I will skip that. It's something, well, you can ask about it. <laughs> um, another thing you want to know is how halo form in simulations, actually. So here, what you're going to see is is one actual halo evolving a simulation. And this kind of circle around is a measure of its inertia tensor that gave essentially the volume of the perturbation. And what you see is evolution in time. So you have the expansion, turn around, and then you kind of virialize, in the sense, stabilize its volume, oscillating around a, a constant value. But what is somewhat surprising that this halo is identified at Rashi zero. And according to the standard law, you expect the last shell to accrete on the halo to collapse at ratio zero. This is always the requirement we do when you do a stand, a stand the fresh actor and so on. But actually, this virilization happens at ratio one in this case. Okay? And you have halos that of the same mass that realize even at ratio two. So uh, I just mean, uh, just one second. I, I have in the next slide. I don't like the term either. So I just use it because it's popularly used, but I, I don't really understand what it means. So I don't know if you know who this guy is. I mean, the, this guy is actually Clausius, who developed the DL theorem. And he taught us that the condition to have virialization in this sense is that the volume is stable. Okay? So what I'm calling virialized is something that keeps the same volume. Okay? <coughs> and now, if you want to. For that halo I was showing before, you would probably say that you want the time average of the volume to be stable, so we'll probably choose 
something around here to say what is the realization time or the collapse time of that object. Now let's look what happens then if you use this definition. Here you have halo mass. And here you have the expansion factor at which the halos collapse. This is the median, this is the scatter. Scholar just means two different things, actually like different boxes. And you see high mass halos are basically indeed collapsing today if you identify them today. But low mass halos tend to be collapsed long time ago, even though you are still identifying them today. And this is actually the median evolution of the outermost shell. And you see that very small ones, actually, so these defined in three colors mean average along all halos of a given mass. Those which are associated with initial low over density and those which are associated with initial high over density. So those which are associated with initial over density basically turn around and derealize. They don't even have a difference between the two masses. Okay? This is actually their mass accretion history. And you can show that this formation time actually correlates pretty well with the half time formation time. So now, let's repeat the game we were doing before. So let's use this, I, what they call ellipsoidal square collapse model. So ellipsoidal collapse model that starts from ellipsoidal initial condition, but require a collapse at this time. So at this collapse time that I can measure for each halo in the simulations, rather than requiring the collapse to be RSG zero as is normally done. And in this case, the agreement between the model and the simulation is very straightforward. Okay. It, it, it depends if you want linear time, it's good enough. Yeah, I'm not able to predict that at the moment. Okay. Yes, correct. Um, this I will skip. But now let's go back to an extended pressure check. So this is the same halo I was showing you, the evolution. This is the extended pressure trajectory. So mass of the top half filter versus the linear delta. And this is actually the actual halo mass. Uh, open symbol is where your extended pressure the theory would give the mass if you use collapse at ratio zero. And the shape of the symbol depends if you use spherical collapse model, ellipsoidal collapse model, or ellipsoidal collapse model with ellipsoidal initial condition. And you see that if you require collapse at ratio zero, you always over predict the mass of the object. But if you require the collapse to happen when in the simulation the collapse happens, you actually do a pretty good job. Yeah. Well, we, we played the game with six or seven different halo funders, different spherical over densities. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm not really understanding your question. I mean, what do you mean the same as you use in your model? Sure. Whenever you stop the collapse, the, the, the minimal influence. I, I can show you. I mean, it's it's very fast way we, we drop. So <coughs> anyway, so if you play the standard pressure. In the paper, we have five different spherical over density, three different f of f, yeah, nothing changes. Yeah. So what I mean is like, <coughs> the spherical over density has a tenth of half, then you have better or worse? Uh, no, it always works the same. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I skipped a slide, but uh, well, I don't have time. Huh? The one before? Yeah, so I'll go back to that. <laughs> if, if Tobias allows. OK. <laughs> So another thing I want to show you, so this is, if you play the discussion set game with the spherical collapse threshold barrier, this is the mass accretion history you would predict, okay, for this trajectory. This is actually what happens in the simulation. So it's pretty good up to a certain point, but then, as Ojung was saying before, this halo stop accreting mass. And it's, well, we wrote papers, similar papers. So so the understanding is that substantially the ties become so strong in the filament that the material cannot fall on the halo anymore. But this is not in discussion pre in, this, in the standard projector theory. And actually, you can ask yourself, the material that according to the standard projector should fall into the halo, where is actually in the simulation? Okay. And if you do that, 
so the, the green is actually what is in the halo. And red and blue are two different times according to the sector, so it's going to shake it. So this is in one projection, it looks kind of collapsed, but look in the opposite direction. It's dispersed along a strong filament. So basically, the presence of the filaments doesn't allow this material to collapse in the halo, while according to EPS, you would expect that to be in the halo. Sorry? They're just two different projections. No, 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 this is ratio zero, I think. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I'm saying that it misses an ingredient. Okay, and the ingredient is that protohelix in initial conditions are not spherical. If you add that ingredient in, it just modifies slightly the equation, and it works much better. With the condition, though, that you don't impose that the collapse time is the same or the identification time. Well, basically, if you look at that, there is a strong shear here, and the matter goes like that. It doesn't, yeah. Well, it, it <laughs> uh, not really. A, a low mass is not an extreme grade. Um, you can. It was the guy in the movie. So basically, the first snapshot is how it looks. It looks pretty elliptical, right? but not extremely elongated. Okay? It's kind of typical 0.8, 0.8 uh, triadic. Yeah. No, the, the, the actually, the axis ratio is the inertia. Yeah, yeah, and the volume is just the volume that contains always the same mass. It contains always the same final mass. So, yeah. No, no, no. Yes, does. Definitely. But we repeated the game with many different halo time goals, and the general trend is always the same. What changes, and this is a good point, is. Yeah, yeah, I, I know your definition and I like it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And what changes is actually where this line is, if you change the LFM. It moves up and down this line. But since I skipped the slide that uh, you like, probably. Yeah, I know. There we, we slightly disagree in the interpretation. Okay, so you basically say that there is a hot flow generated but by the tides. Yeah, yeah. You were saying that substantially the velocities are too high to accrete on the halo, while we see it more as really a shear velocity or the velocity field that prevents the accretion there. But yeah, yeah. So then if you look at I would it's totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but this is not in the model, okay? No. So the the slide has skipped, so thank you for the extra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the recent times when I was observing the Lucas halo, I never I did not see the halo. Well what is elongated halo? There is no elongated halo. Where did you see elongated halo? The halo is the green. The red one is what a standard flechette would assign to the halo, but tides sheared away. Okay. So, <coughs> so actually, to convince that material is not really falling onto these halos anymore, so this is the, the radial velocity profile of our low mass halos. 
And what you see is essentially this was already shown in the past. I mean, we are not playing with new results. But, um, you have the stable region where, <laughs> you know, where the halo exists. And then you go directly to Hubble flow. There is no infolding region in between. While if you go to a high mass halos, they have clearly an infolding region in between. We are still accreting mass nowadays. And this is the, well, my version of we should defi change the definition of halo. So tomorrow I think I will show something. Uh, basically, this is the same guy as before. A redshift zero and a redshift, what we call the collapse redshift, is the density profile. And you see that this was R200 at the collapse time. This is R200 at ratio zero. The density profile is absolutely identical. So we just grow in this, this halo, if you want, artificially, because we like to define the virialized part in terms of density contours. But no, it, it will end up in the, in the guys at the end of the film. Where is it? No, I lost that. It basically will accrete here. Yeah. Normally, you okay. Well, I had conclusions. I leave them there. But and I think that the real challenge, if if we can develop a model for this, what decides what is the last shell to accrete? 